All right, welcome to the State of Latinx Historic Preservation in the United States. Before we get be begin, we have a few housekeeping reminders for attendees. This session is being recorded, including the chat box. Please abide by the conference code of conduct during conference sessions. All participants will be muted during the presentations. The chat function is enabled for specific session questions or comments that you may have. You can find help to all your other questions in the FAQ section of the SOCIO app or website, or use the attendee customer service room accessible in the virtual platform schedule. Closed captioning is available and can be accessed by enabling it in your Zoom screen settings. And now I'd like to turn over the program to our panelists. Thanks so much. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Desiree Aranda and I'm the moderator for today's session. I'm joining today from my hometown of Phoenix, Arizona in the Salt River Valley on the ancestral territories of indigenous peoples, including Hohokam, Atum, and Peeposh or Maricopa communities. Thanks so much for attending our session, the State of Latinx Historic Preservation in the United States. Today's session was organized by Latinos in Heritage Conservation, for which I have the pleasure of serving as co-chair. For those who may be new to our group, Latinos in Heritage Conservation, or LHC for short, is a national organization dedicated to elevating and preserving the stories, heritage, and culture of diverse Latinx communities throughout the United States. LHC formed in 2014, and I'm so excited to report that earlier this year, LHC became an official 501c3 nonprofit organization. This is a huge milestone for those of us involved and for the future of Latinx historic preservation more broadly. If you haven't already, I encourage you to sign up for our quarterly newsletter and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. I've put our website in the chat box. The, session, the title of today's session is The State of Latinx Historic Preservation in the US. The last few years have no doubt been difficult and challenging in many regards. And this is true for Latinx heritage sites as well. Against the backdrop of a global pandemic where black and brown communities continue to be disproportionately impacted and extreme weather events also affect our communities unequally, the Trump administration continues its relentless attack of Latinx immigrants no better symbolized than through its racist border wall project, which has destroyed thousands of miles of sensitive ecological areas as well as sacred and historical native sites. Meanwhile, increasing economic inequality and gentrification within our urban areas have all brought about threats to longstanding Latinx neighborhoods and communities throughout the country. In the face of all of these challenges, there have also been several bright spots. Our communities are resilient and many are engaged more than ever before to preserve our history and places of importance. And this year, the National Trust included two Latinx sites on their 11 most endangered list, including the Ponce Historic Zone in Puerto Rico and the Alazan Apache Courts in San Antonio, Texas. Inclusion of these sites in the 11 most endangered list gives us promise of, of positive outcomes for both communities. So today, we're going to hear from three really amazing speakers joining us from coast to coast who will share challenges and successes they've had with Latinx historic preservation efforts. Our first speaker is Edward Torres, preservation architect and principal at Bar Latosa Studio in Chicago. Then we'll hear from Rosalind Sagara, neighborhood outreach coordinator for the Los Angeles Conservancy, where she aims to empower people to preserve historic places that matter to them. And we'll end with a presentation from Diego Robayo, historic preservation advocate with the Historic Districts Council, where he does outreach in New York City's Spanish speaking communities. After the presentations, we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, please type any questions you may have into the chat box. Uh, with that introduction, I'll hand it over to you, Ed. Great, I will uh, attempt to um, share this screen in a minute, great. Okay, um, I'm gonna put my timer on just so I'm, since I'm first, I don't wanna start being late. So I'm Edward Torres, as mentioned, uh, in Chicago, preservation architect. There's my email in the bottom, etorres at barolatostudio.com. If you have any questions, 
about anything I'm presenting today, uh, please feel uh, feel free to email me um, on that. So I've been talking about this actually for the last two years about the Pilsen designated historic district. Two years later, we are still not we're uh, we're still not a historic district. Um, Pilsen community is about three and a half miles from downtown Chicago. Um, it was uh, more more or less formed in the 19th century by uh, Germans, Polish, Italian, and eventually Czechs who end up building a lot of the current stock of buildings that are there. In 1950s and 60s, the uh, the great migration of not just African Americans but also of Mexican Americans coming up north along the railroad, and a lot of them stopping in Chicago to find work and homes. And Pilsen was the sort of served as the Ellis Island of Chicago for that. So, um, and the Mexican American population grew up to almost 90% of the community. In 2006, a nomination was made um, to uh, include Pilsen uh, on the National Register. Um, uh, this was done by, uh, led by a professor and students. Um, and it was, it's a good uh, nomination. Um, most of it carried the Bohemian history, the Eastern European history of the built environment. Not much was mentioned um, about the Mexican history and the immigration and none of the murals, which uh, I forgot, I failed to mention that uh, Pilsen has hundreds of murals currently starting from 1968 when the, the mural movement was uh, starting in, in the United States uh, all the way to currently to last week. Um, so uh, many murals are um, included in the district, but none were uh, were included in, in, the, in the National uh, Register of 4,000, 4, over 4,000 properties. Fast forward to two, two, uh, 2019, last year, um, I'm gonna be talking about a, a preservation strategy later that included this uh, local historic district destination. So here, um, the city uh, uh, retained, actually retained our company to do a uh, local historic uh, destination, which included over 875 contributing properties. Um, the, the buildings and the murals were both included. Uh, we had about approximately 75 murals that were included in the, in the report. And the report, as you can see, there's a copy of the cover. It was trans translated into Spanish. My sister, who's an attorney, actually did it. So it was, it was within the family. Um, being a local historic district, uh, you have sort of leeway as opposed to the National Register uh, standards or guidelines. We, we, uh, it, we included uh, five criteria, heritage, architecture, art, distinctive theme, which is a lot of the architecture that is still in place, still intact from the 19th century built by the, by the Czechs and the Eastern Europeans. And finally, uh, the criteria seven, which, was, which includes distinct physical appearances, and that involved the murals. Here's a map overlaid of what we did in 2019, the red, and the blue indicates the national registration uh, done in 2006, more than 15 years ago. And you can see that the, 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 the difference of size. Now the local district, as I mentioned, is still pending. Um, and later on, I'll talk about the pushback on this designation locally here. So I mentioned the preservation strategy. The city of Chicago, um, introduce a, in 2018, late 2018, December, like a day before the National Trust Conference in San Francisco, it was introduced by the mayor then, uh, Emmanuel, um, uh, that would include not just a designated landmark district, but also affordable, um, enhancing the affordable requirements, creating new housing, uh, jobs and industrial modernization strategy, and then uh, quality of life elements like open space improvements. So these five elements were included in the total preservation strategy of this neighborhood of Pilsen and also in the, hopefully in the future in Little Village. This uh, strategy included uh, affordable uh, requirement ordinance that would increase the 20% affordability in new developments Currently, uh, it's 10%, I think it's 10%. I'm, um, I don't know if it's changed, but I think it's 10%. Um, and also, it would, it would also address existing residents, which is sort of new, 
um, in terms of now during COVID, a lot of this happening now with uh, rentals and, 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 and people not be able to afford their homes. Uh, but this was, this was introduced before the COVID. Um, and this was also include reducing property taxes. And th the reason for this is so, so displacement um, would not happen immediately or would not happen or minimize it during the, uh, it being a designated area. Also, which is, was just introduced by the commissioner, Commissioner Cox from, uh, who came here from Detroit, uh, a new city grant program for homeowner improvements for $3 million to improve their homes. And that would include the exterior and interior. Uh, 3 million, I know it's not enough for 400 homes in the district, um, but I think that's gonna be the starting of that program. Um, the other two are industrial corridor, uh, to foster or to um, uh, attract uh, companies um, because Pilsen, the neighborhood happens to be next to industrial corridor um, and not far away. So uh, the plan is to start thinking of uh, planning, uh, the uh, enhancing the Pilsen industrial corridor with, with new manufacturing and new um, companies. And finally, the open space enhancements of parks and um, this paseo has been planned and, and it's being implemented um, uh, near uh, Pilsen and it would connect uh, another neighborhood called Little Village, just south of it, about, about six to seven blocks south. So one of the things that uh, we also, another project that we were retained uh, with SB Friedman, uh, who is the prime, was now if it does become a designated district, um, what, uh, how can the homeowners um, improve at least their facades, their windows? So we came up, this is just a sample of the report, but here it shows a common building, a cottage, uh, masonry building in, in Pilsen. And we identify some of the um, elements of a house and we put some numbers, estimated costs to see how much that could, uh, to, to assist uh, ourselves and, and property tax issues and how the incentives can be used uh, for these small, uh, modest buildings, um, working with the city and the county here, of how the incentives can work uh, um, with the uh, with the tax incentives. So, why preservation strategy plan? Well, um, Pilsen has about eighty thousand residents. Um, the Hispanic population has gone down about twenty two percent. So, maybe eighteen thousand to twenty thousand have moved out. Up to 90 structures have been demolished in the last 15 years, and that is before it's designated. Um, and the goal of the preservation uh, strategy plan is to preserve buildings, housing, murals, and communities. Um, and also maybe to create some environmental justice. There's an image of an implosion of a smoke sack that gave no warning to the community, and that big smoke was on a beautiful day uh, engulf the, 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 the community of Little Village and Pilsen. The pushback, uh, a lot of people don't want this designation. Um, they have over 400 signatures of homeowners in the district. As you can see, there's uh, some chats of, uh, that they've had Zoom and there's, the, there's some of the dialogue, forget the murals, protect the working class, stop the Pilsen landmark ordinance. It's, um, the movement is, they're afraid that this is really gonna displace people uh, although the commissioner is pushing that the preservation district will serve as a tool to save, including with the other elements. My tips on this is, um, in terms of the pushback is, uh, when this is introduced, uh, and I'm, I'm noticing that perhaps this was rushed a bit by the city because of the election that was happening at the time, is to develop a comprehensive plan that preservation becomes a tool to minimize displacement. Um, start the conversations early with the community about what does it mean to be designated as a district. Um, review the tax structure so the, the so that the structure that is now in place can be altered or amended to assist uh, modest homeowners on getting some tax relief um, somehow and some way or getting some incentives. And finally, provide technical assistance to homeowners regarding rehab and what does this all mean. So that's, uh, that's basically what I want to give an update on the Pilsen. Thank you.
Thanks, Ed. We're going to now hear from Rosalind Sagara from the LA Conservancy. We'll give them a moment to switch um, screens. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rosalind Sagara with the, I'm the Neighborhood Outreach Coordinator with the Los Angeles Conservancy. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I will be sharing information about the Conservancy's project to designate the Chicano Moratorium in Los Angeles to the National Register of Historic Places. And, um, but before I highlight some of the pla places and people associated with this nomination, I wanted to provide a very brief summary of the Chicano Moratorium in Los Angeles for those who may not be familiar with this history. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I'll, um, I'll also share a, a tip or a takeaway from this project. Oops. So in 1969 through 1971, the Chicano Moratorium was a movement of Chicano and Latino anti-Vietnam War activists who converged in Los Angeles to protest racial injustice and the disproportionate death toll of Mexican American soldiers in the Vietnam War. Activists linked the Vietnam War and unjust conditions at home. Pervasive discrimination disadvantaged Mexican Americans through inferior schooling and housing, poor jobs and police abuse. These conditions in turn made them vulnerable to the draft or precipitated enlistment. So our nomination project includes four components three national register nominations and an amendment to the California's existing statewide historic context on Latinos in the 20th century, which now will include a new theme on the Chicano Oh my goodness, you haven't been hearing me. <laughs> Let me go back. We've um, heard you. It was just like the last few seconds that you went mute for some reason. Okay. Yeah. Apologies. Um, okay. So um, did you hear the last part about the, the components of the documentation project? Um, no, maybe we could start there. Okay. Um, so the nomination project includes four components. So that's three National Register nominations and an amendment to the California, California's existing statewide historic context on Latinos in 20th century, um, which now will include a new theme on the Chicano Moratorium in Los Angeles. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about um, this first nomination. Um, we nominated the first Chicano Moratorium March, which happened on December 20th, 1969. And this is a map that traces the March route. The March began at noon at, in the area of the Five Points Memorial and pictured here as one of the sites that's um, included in this area. Um, this is in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of um, the city of Los Angeles. Um, and, and the march in 1969 began with a reading of the names of Mexican Americans who died in combat in the Vietnam War. Following the reading, marchers proceeded down Indiana Street following six Chicanos who were carrying a symbolic coffin. Behind them, people held a large blood spattered portrait of Private J.J. Montes who was a representative of many of the Chicano soldiers who had died in Vietnam. 70 Brown Berets led the rest of the march. So the 1.1 mile route follows flat residential streets in a neighborhood of low rise, predominantly single family homes. And here's a view of the march route. The route terminated at Obregón Park in unincorporated East LA, where about 2,000 people gathered for a rally. The success of this march garnered public support and attention for the Chicano movement and subsequent Chicano moratorium marches. 
We also nominated the Brown Beret headquarters on 4th and Mott Streets in Boyle Heights in the city of Los Angeles. The Brown Berets were instrumental in the formation of the Chicano Moratorium Committee in December 1969. Their mission was to mobilize Chicanos not just against the war, but against the social injustices that they faced at home. Though the Brown Berets met in several locations during the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, this location across the street from Roosevelt High School was um, conveniently located for nearby student members. Lastly, we nominated the National Chicano Moratorium March of August 29, 1970. And this nomination includes several contributing buildings and sites in unincorporated East LA. The march began at East Third Street in front of what is now the East LA um, Civic Center and progressed east on Beverly, south on Atlantic, then went west on Whittier and ended in Laguna Park which is now known as Salazar Park. The 3.26 mile route follows a level street path um, characterized by mostly low rise commercial buildings um, that are from the 1920s to 1960s. And the image on the left shows the approximate location of the start of the march. And on the right is a view from um, Atlantic Boulevard. And while the signage and the storefronts may have changed since 1970s, the low-rise commercial buildings continue to typify the streets. Located on Whittier Boulevard near Ciela Avenue is a single-story contributing commercial building. This building housed the East LA Free Clinic, also known as El Barrio Free Clinic. Today it houses um, the legacy biz business mission furniture. Um, the clinic was established by the, by the Brown Berets um, and in 1969 and led by female members of the organization. It was the first free clinic in East LA and represented the community service mission of the organization. Um, through the free clinic, the Brown Berets sought to improve the lives of the Chicano community by providing access to healthcare, education, and resources. Many early moratorium committee meetings took place um, at this location. Another important contributing building to the nomination is a building that housed the Silver Dollar Cafe. This is where prominent journalist Ruben Salazar, who was covering the march for the LA Times and the Spanish language station KMEX died. Salazar and his colleagues retreated to the Silver Dollar Cafe a few hours after covering the day's events. And shortly after, patrol cars stopped in front of the bar um, with several officers approaching the door. Um, LA County Sheriff Deputy Thomas Wilson fired two tear gas projectiles into the bar, and one of them struck Salazar in the head, uh, killing him instantly. The violent outcome to the August 1970 march convinced many Chicano activists and community members to focus on the unique struggles of the Chicano community. Um, Um, this is a photo of Ruben Salazar Park. Um, it's the terminus of the National Chicano Moratorium March. And um, as of August of this year, the Chicano Moratorium in Los Angeles nominations have been recommended for listing to the National Register of Historic Places by our State Historical Resources Commission. The nominations are now with the National Park Service awaiting uh, final approval. And so in terms of a takeaway or tips, um, I would say that how critically important it is to build engagement throughout the project. Community members want to participate and support projects that recognize underrepresented places and history. Ideally, your engagement is not gonna end once the project is completed. Um, um, for example, in our case, now that we're 
getting close to, to reaching our final step, we're really looking forward to hearing community members' ideas for sharing this history with the larger public. And so I hope we'll have time to hear some of your ideas and suggestions as well. Here is my contact information and I've provided a link to more information about about the project. Um, if you go to this link, you will also um, be able to access the nomination documents. Thank you very much. And um, I'll let Diego go next. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Diego. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I work for the Historic Districts Council. The Historic Districts Council is an organization that works in New York City to preserve the architectural and cultural heritage of all five boroughs. And this year, we're turning 50 years. So it's a very special year for us. Um, I work specifically on Spanish speaking communities and my background is in journalism. So most of my job, as you will see in this presentation has been um, doing community outreach and interviewing people. So for this presentation, I'm gonna focus on these three points, uh, ways that I've been using to involve Hispanic communities in historic preservation what does historic preservation mean for Hispanic communities? And I'm also gonna be talking about the Bronx Borough Landmarks Committee, which is something that we started uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, before that, I wanna give a little introduction. Um, so New York City has one of the most uh, comprehensive landmarks laws in, in, in the country. But traditionally, the Landmarks Preservation Commission has mainly centered on the architectural features of a building um, to consider it for, for designation. Even though in theory, they should also consider the historic and cultural value of a place. Um, in my opinion, this is because uh, acknowledging the cultural and historic significance of a building is a more um, subjective process than doing it with, uh, with the architectural features of a building. For example, in the picture on the left, we can all agree that uh, this is architecturally magnificent and it should be preserved and that's the flat iron building in Manhattan. But to acknowledge the cultural and historic contributions of places in neighbor neighborhoods that have traditionally been disregarded uh, by the preservation um, uh, entities in New York City, I think uh, a more, um, Work, journalistic work uh, needs to be done. And that's what I've been trying to, to do uh, at the Historic Districts Council. I've been um, going to the communities, interviewing people, talking to people, learning about the, the history and knowing what places are relevant for their, for their history. So during this process uh, at the Historic Districts Council, we've been doing a lot of walking tours from locals to locals. Uh, this was a very special walking tour that we had at the beginning of this year. It was in the South Bronx, which is a mainly Hispanic area in New York City. And we wanted to have um, um, just locals for this walking tour, because when we started doing outreach in Hispanic neighborhoods in New York City, we saw a very low engagement. So we wanted to um, integrate them more, to involve them more, to make them feel that we wanted to be uh, engaged just with them. And we had a very fun time. The lady on, on the right, she, she was 92 years old at the time of the, of the tour. And she gave us some interesting stories about the neighborhood as, as we kept walking. So, so that was very satisfying to see all that local engagement in these walking tours. Um, we've also been doing interviews to business owners and people who somehow have contributed to the identity of their neighborhoods. Uh, these 
uh, two men. I, I had the pleasure to interview to interview them a, a few months ago. The one on the left was um, Joe Torres. He he was the founder of uh, Joe's Place, which was a very um, iconic restaurant in Parchester in the Bronx, and he used to serve Puerto Rican food, and he used to say that uh, he wanted to use Puerto Rican cuisine to integrate all the different communities that were in that neighborhood. He unfortunately, he passed away a few months ago due to coronavirus, uh, but I had the pleasure to talk to, talk to him and, and it was wonderful. Uh, the one on the right is Mike Amadeo. He is the owner of Casa Amadeo, which is the oldest Latino music store in, in New York City. And by interviewing these people, we have had the opportunity to publish articles in local media. And that way we've seen a, a very high engagement from residents who know these people. And so that's been a very uh, important way for us to, to do some outreach and to tell uh, residents that uh, the history of their neighborhood so needs to be preserved. Uh, we've also been doing educational gatherings where we ask people to tell us about their ideas and concerns in terms of historic preservation. They also um, talk us about their favorite buildings uh, in their neighborhood. And uh, it's been very, very satisfying to see all this uh, engagement. And what is so special about these activities is that we want to give a, a relevant role to, to the local residents. We want them to give the presentations, we want them to be the attendees. And um, for example, a few weeks ago, we had a virtual tour um, where someone living in the South Bronx walked us through all the places that she found very interesting in, in terms of um, uh, Latino, Latino music. Um, and we had a very good turnout and and also a few weeks ago, we had a Mike Amadeo joined for a Zoom meeting where he, he told us about all the um, challenges and uh, all the concerns that he's been having in this um, pandemic. And people were asking him how he's doing during this uh, time. And it was so interesting to hear that he's been doing very, very well, that his business has been doing very well during this pandemic. And the reason is because when, when he was asked, how come your, your business is doing so well during this pandemic, he said that people, if, they, if they're going to have to stay at home, they need some kind of distraction. And that distraction, that perfect distraction is an instrument. So he's been selling a lot of uh, guitars and instruments. Uh, so his business has been doing really, really well. Um, so all these activities, they have an educational purpose. And ultimately, we through these activities, we want to increase the engagement of Latino communities in uh, different process of historic uh, preservation. So for example, if there is going to be a public hearing uh, to designate a building in a, in a Hispanic neighborhood, we want them to, to go and testify in favor. That's the ultimate goal of, of all these um, uh, activities and doing this uh, doing the all these outreach and all these activities have come to realize that historic preservation in uh, hispanic neighborhoods in new york city is more about people it's more about the stories of those um, local leaders that somehow have contributed to the evolution of, of their neighborhoods it could be a business owner uh, restaurant owner, someone who owns a um, music store. So part of my job has been to talk to these people, write articles and publish them on, on local media. And we've also, when we do some, uh, some of our programs in um, Hispanic neighborhoods, we tend to highlight these cultural a heritage in, in all those neighborhoods. This was a, a walking tour brochure that we did for East Harlem. And uh, this uh, walking tour brochure was done in Spanish and it has 
uh, it features all the murals in East Harlem that are relevant to, to the community. Um, lastly, I want to talk about the Bronx Borough Landmarks Committee. The Bronx Borough Landmarks Committee is a coalition of Bronx residents. Uh, we gather to share ideas about how to preserve specific buildings. And we also ask people to uh, give us presentations about their neighborhoods. Uh, we have, we've had a very good response um, from um, local residents all over the Bronx who have been telling us about their neighborhoods. And we've had uh, uh, around 30 to 40 people attend each meeting. Um, so that, that's been very satisfying. Um, thank you. Thank you, Diego and Rosalind and Ed. Um, well, with that, we, I'd like to uh, open it for Q&A. We have a few minutes. Um, thank you to our speakers for those really insightful presentations. Um, if anyone has questions they'd like to ask, um, please put them in the chat box. Um, there were a few that came up already that I, I noted. Um, so let me go ahead and ask that. Um, so the, the first question goes to Ed, um, but really any anyone can address this. Um, a number of, of the panelists talked about, you know, community outreach engagement, right? And, and the importance of doing that from early on, from the beginning. Um, and myself having worked in both the nonprofit advocacy world and govern local government planning department know you know, how much work that is, right? And there's so much emotional labor that goes into a lot of these projects working with communities of color um, that have historically, right, been um, disenfranchised, marginalized, um, and there's a trust issue there, right? So and a, a few people noted, um, they're glad you spoke up about the pushback, Ed, and someone else noted they've been following this story a lot and they're interested to address community concern. Um, is there anything else, Ed, that you want to kind of um, share with the group on about that experience? Um, and then for any of the other panelists, if you have ideas for you know, how to go about doing um, that community work on these projects, then please feel free to join in. Well, I think, I think the pushback for um, here, the Pilsen is the timing of this. So there was an election coming up in February. We were hired in December of the previous year of 2018, there was an election in 2019 for a new alderman in, the, in Chicago. The aldermen are sort of the mayors of their wards. They have a lot of, they currently still have a lot of power in what happens in their wards. So it's a new alderman. Um, he's concerned that there wasn't a community process. There was a community process, it was quick, but being a, being a, a Mexican American community, there's a lot of distrust in, there's a lot of trust uh, with, the, with the government, with the city. There's language barriers. Um, there's uh, there's um, not having the knowledge of what historic district means and, and that it can serve as a tool. But the, the community is really afraid of displacement, continuing displacement, continuing of, of, of lack of resources for affordable housing and for all the other elements that are part of that preservation plan. I think one lesson learned here, if I, you know, it's not dead yet, but I, if there is one thing that we, that has been learned is when you roll out this, when you roll out a preservation strategy, um, it's good to, if you could bring some other elements to it, like affordable housing incentives or affordable housing, or if you have a plan of, of minimizing displacement of people who have lived there for 60 years and, and also controlling the taxes or the cost of living of being there. If that could all be rolled up in a nice big ball and put a bow on it and introduce that to the community, I think historic preservation will probably be welcome because it, it's going to go as part of the, um, as the solution to, uh, to displacement and to, in, and to preserving the community, the character of the building. So you don't have 90 demolitions in 15 years. So that's, that's the pushback is uh, a, a number of things, politics, uh, people who are afraid of what's going to happen in the future if it is designated, some misinformation, 
So, I mean, I don't, I mean, the community is, I, I don't live in this community, so it's hard for me to say, but um, we, you know, um, we're trying to do that now. So I'm sure there's people out there who have this a number of times of underrepresented that you do get some pushback because it's, it's unknown. <clears throat> um, Rosalind or Diego, do you have anything um, to add on that? Both of you spoke a, a little bit about um, you know, community engagement. Um, Diego, I think your work in really doing all of that community engagement right on the front end and building up communities and, and working in partnership um, is one strategy that could work, right? Versus um, a project kind of coming from city um, or government. Um, but doing it, you know, from the ground up, grassroots is always something that um, tends, and from what I've seen and in my experience, tends to work better. Um, I don't know if either of you have any. Other yeah, thoughts? yeah, I, I think um, that's been uh, to see all the engagement uh, after doing all these outreach um, a few months ago. We, uh, the Landmarks Commission had a public hearing to designate the Manita Street in the Bronx. And it was wonderful to see some of the members of the Bronx Borough Landmarks Committee to attend that meeting and testify in favor of the designation. So, so I think that uh, is uh, ultimately the goal of this um, outreach work that I've been doing uh, to make people more interested in, in preserving the history of their neighborhoods, which uh, at the beginning, it was very difficult, uh, especially in uh, Hispanic communities. Um, but um, after, after doing all this work, after interviewing all these people, uh, it's been very wonderful to see how they are more engaged in, in, for example, a public hearing or a campaign that we want to push. So these, um, grassroots uh, work, I think, uh, that I've been doing has been uh, fruitful, yeah. I would just add, um, you know, the work that Diego's doing is, is so great because um, it's really about relationship building, um, you know, identifying key, key members of the community who have an interest, who want to be involved, and then, and then growing your relationship to those to those individuals. And um, in turn, that's helping to build capacity in the neighborhood to, to take on some of these, these issues, um, preservation and non-preservation related. Um, I think that sometimes um, we, you know, we have project deadlines and we have to get things going. Um, and so sometimes we, um, you know, agencies, even nonprofit organizations, um, we'll kind of um, start our, we have a limited time to do, to do outreach, I think. And I think that that's, that kind of deficit mindset is not, is not really healthy. I think that we need to think about um, incorporating community engagement throughout a project from um, the beginning, but also, you know, during and, after the project is done, because I mean, just because a project's done doesn't mean you you don't want to keep those um, relationships active. And um, yeah, so I would just say that um, we try to think about um, community engagement as um, something that is a long term effort. Yeah, I I just you're right, and I agree with you guys, and I think maybe some of the being more creative about not in our case it would be nice if we can introduce like a cultural district that could overlay this like they've done in some other cities and um, one thing i forgot to mention was the murals so what happens since this is all gone for the last two years our department of cultural affairs has actually taken over the guidelines for the murals to help people uh, give them some guidelines how to preserve that so i i failed to mention that earlier on my presentation but I think there has to be more, a um, uh, lot of relationship building. Um, and what Diego's doing is, is fantastic because it's sort of different than what we did in, in that. And maybe it could have helped us a little bit of what Diego's doing now. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, governments can and should also be involved in doing that, right? So often it falls on nonprofits or community-based organizations to do that work. Um, so that's just uh, a final thought on, on that topic. There's so many other questions. I know we won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but another question Ros uh, was for Rosalind. Um, so they said, it seems like these march routes could be great opportunities for urban trails that could integrate interpretive elements. Has there been any community-based discussion about this type of concept? That has been brought up. Um, we actually, as I mentioned, um, as we're kind of looking forward to the, the designation from the National Park Service, we, we do want to find ways to get this history um, out to the to the public, and you know, oftentimes we we work on these nominations or reports, and they kind of end up on a shelf, um, an agency shelf or a, um, organization um, bookcase or what what have you. And um, I think we need to do more to to get this history out to the community, and so. Um, It'd be great to have something visible. Um, the city of Los Angeles has um, markers um, and different programs to show um, historic landmark status. But um, you know, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can get really creative and and partnering with with other local organizations um, to help bring this story to community. Thank you. Um, okay, and then we're going to have one final question. Um, there was a question for you, Diego. Um, has the Bronx Borough Landmarks Preservation Committee considered ways to preserve NYC's murals in Hispanic neighborhoods? If so, what are some of the ideas discussed so far? Um, no, the, the Bronx Borough Landmarks Committee has, um, we haven't discussed that yet. Uh, it's been more, um, a platform for residents to share uh, their ideas and to share uh, their knowledge about the history of their neighborhoods. Um, but so far, we have not discussed strategies to preserve those those uh, places. As I said, uh, this has um, an educational focus uh, first, which is uh, uh, important to get people uh, uh, interested about historic preservation. But I think once we have uh, identified, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 or 15 people who, who are willing to take a step further, I think we're gonna start discussing more um, strategies to preserve the, those places. But uh, so far we've only had um, people talking about their, their neighborhood, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, well, thank you all so much for attending our session. We have a few minutes left. I wanted to just make um, a few announcements. Um, if you want to learn more about programming around Latinx cultural heritage conservation, please follow LHC on Instagram and Facebook and sign up for our quarterly e-newsletter. Um, you can follow us, at, find all those links at latinoheritage.us. Uh, to learn more about the Alasan Apache Courts, one of the two Latino sites listed in this year's 11 Most Endangered Places, please check out tomorrow's session's deep dive discussion about the use of integrity standards. It's at 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and that'll just, they'll discuss how the integrity standard is often a barrier to historic designation in communities of color. Um, and then lastly, please save the date for September 16th through 18th of 2021. LHC will be hosting our upcoming biennial convening on Latino heritage. Um, it will be, it's called Congreso and we will hopefully be gathering in person in Denver in 2021. Again, that's September 16th through the 18th. You can follow us on social media, sign up for our newsletter to get updates. Um, all right, I think that about covers it. Thank you all again to our incredible panelists um, and to everyone who attended. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.